You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is about a mother of three who was murdered. And the question still stands, did the mayor do it? When rumors speak of corruption and murder with an entire town pointing fingers to one man, how does he not become a suspect? How many people have to be in on a cover-up before one slips up and tells the truth? What happened that night at that secret party? Or did it happen at all? Now, I also want to thank Crime Town Podcast for the incredible coverage on this case that helped me find so much information about it. They also do interviews with people who were involved in this case. And if you would like to go and listen, I will have that linked down below. So huge shout out to them. And I also want to thank our sponsor, Skillshare. I've seriously learned so much from the classes that I've taken on their website. Now, one that I took recently was Modern Money Habits, Five Steps to Build the Life You Want by Justin Bridges. He is a wonderful teacher and he goes into how to get better with money, which is something I've been interested in since I am still in the process of moving, which you would know about if you're subscribed to my second channel. I'll have that link down below as well. But Skillshare is the perfect place to expand your knowledge on things and not stay stagnant in life, especially right now when it's so easy to just fall into doing nothing, learning nothing, and just relaxing all the time, but it's so important to keep our mind engaged and, you know, focus on tasks that make us a better person. You can choose from things like web development, marketing, business analytics, productivity, and so much more. It's less than $10 a month and you can take any classes you want. So if you want to try it out, the first 1,000 of you to click the link below will get a free trial of the premium membership. And thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring my video. Once again, I I love you guys and I'm so thankful to be working with you. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 2003 in Michigan and Tamara Green lived in Detroit. Tamara was a 27 year old who by this time had three beautiful children. Now, a lot of people who knew her called her Tammy and she had grown up in a family that didn't have much and often didn't even have food to eat. So she was very determined to give her children a good life and not live like she was raised. She was actually in school to become a nurse and meanwhile she was working as an exotic dancer to make money. The name she went by at the club to be safe about the entire thing was Strawberry. So Tamara was working very, very hard at this time and she was also very close to a pastor named Ken Hampton. She had been with this pastor, seeing this pastor since she was a little girl and she was really still close to him and wanting to just have the best life for her possible. Tamara was known to be a beautiful, wonderful, hardworking woman and amazing mother and her and her children's father, who was Terrace Jackson, had actually met at a concert and Terrace had helped Tamara get away from this creepy guy and they started dating after that. And they were together for a while, had a child, and then they separated. Now, Terrace was still in her life and was a very present father at the time, but they were no longer together. Tamara's children absolutely adored their mother. However, three little lives would forever be changed this year. One of her children was a little girl named Ashley who was with her father, Terrace, the night of April 30th. And as she was sleeping away in bed, her father, and Tamara's ex-boyfriend was watching TV. And that is when a name popped up that he knew well. The news said that the mother of his child, Tamara Green, was dead. She was found at 3.40 a.m. in her car next to her boyfriend who was named Eric Mitchell. And they were actually just parked right in front of his home about to drive away when they were shot to death. Well, when Tamara was. An autopsy showed she had been shot behind the left ear, through the jaw, through the left arm and chest. Eric Mitchell had been shot five times as well, with one in the neck. However, somehow, in some sort of miracle, he survived. 
A 40 caliber weapon had been used on them and surprisingly it was Eric who had called the police to be dispatched to them and they got to his street in front of his home which was at Roseland Street and West Outer Drive where they were both sitting in their car. Once Eric Mitchell was stable enough, he did give a statement about what had happened and he said that he and Tamara had just driven up to his home after they were both at the club that Tamara worked at and that is when he saw a white Chevrolet Blazer which was like an SUV turn the corner and then a man was holding a pistol out the window towards them. He said that he ducked into the car but he didn't tell Tamara what was going on and that is when Eric was asked to describe the shooter and Eric told them that he was a light-skinned and he was like a short man that he had fought a few weeks prior. Prior. Now, Eric was not a professional fighter or anything like that. This was a basically an argument that he had gotten into with this man. However, I cannot find whether this man was ever found, whether it was connected to the fight that Eric had had prior to this, but this man was never questioned to my knowledge. Now, the rumors surrounding this case were horrible. Many believed it was just a drive-by shooting. Some believed that Eric was the intended target because he was actually a drug dealer and often had enemies because of that. But those who knew Tamara had another theory. And this was that just a few months prior to her death, she had actually been hired to go to this huge party. But at this point, nobody knew about this party or no one was really wanting to take it seriously because they believed it was just a rumor. So Sergeant Marion Stevenson had arrived at this crime scene and was told that nobody wanted to work with her on this case. She was basically working on it alone because everybody believed they were going to be shot just like Tamara. Because this party wasn't just a random house party even though nobody wanted to say it was a party at all, but those who did speak of it said that it was actually at the Manoogian Mansion, which was the mayor's home. Kwame Kilpatrick was the mayor of Detroit at this time, and this huge party was more of an urban legend in this community than anything. No one spoke of it at full volume, only in whispers if they even got the courage to speak of it at all. This was mainly said to be because Kwame's wife, Carlita, did not know of the parties he was throwing, of the dancers he was hiring, and of his actions when he wasn't with her. However, from the Crime Town podcast, it was revealed that the night of the party, 911 was called to a gas station, and this was by Tamara, who was crying and an EMS arrived to see what was wrong and found that she was badly beaten up with her eye swollen. She was still crying and she said that she had been at the party dancing at the Manoogian when she was beaten up by Kwame. That is when Kwame's wife hit her in the face and she was then taken to the hospital. But it would take a whole tangled web of an investigation before anything to actually be linked from Tamara to this party. All of the officers had were rumors at this point, or so the public thought. But nearly a month later, on May 21st, a tip was called in to a police department. It was from an anonymous caller who claimed that Tamara Green was absolutely at this party that did in fact happen that night. Now you may be thinking this party happened months prior to her death. What does this have to do with her death? Well, it has to do with a lot, but this was huge for anybody to be coming forward with this considering everybody was terrified of this. Everyone believed they could be next. And if someone did call in, they either disguised their voice or their phone number so that it could not be traced back to them and they could not be outed as an informant. But like I said, Pastor Ken Hampton had always been there for Tamara, and he said that a few weeks before she was murdered, she had called him saying that she was scared and she was in trouble and she wanted to talk to him. So Ken decided to set up a meeting with her in a very safe location, and that is when they met up and he said that she was completely afraid. She said she didn't know what to do and that she believed her life was in danger. 
Now, Ken told her to go see her mother who lived in a different state, but unfortunately, this didn't occur before she was killed. Now, Tamara's children had to be told that their mother was gone forever, and her funeral was held at the Grace Bible Chapel with Pastor Ken Hampton in attendance, and this is also where Tamara's mother, Brenda, told Ken that a man she knew was at the funeral. But this wasn't a man who should have been there because Brenda said this is a man that Tamara had told her had beaten her up. This man also brought a bodyguard with him to a funeral. Pastor Ken told Brenda that it was okay because he was filming the entire thing to give to investigators. Nothing was said to be done about this footage even though Ken did give it to the police and nobody knows who was really on it. Now, the chief of police named Jerry Oliver allegedly began to request files for Tamara's case multiple times from the people working on it. And then when he did, suddenly all of these files would go missing. Now, Sergeant Marion Stevenson, who has been on this case since the beginning, was working this case still and she said that she had written case notes, she had started to interview witnesses, and all of these things were disappearing. Her entire hard drive had been erased. She kept floppy disks of evidence locked up in a box, those were taken, and she had notebooks with witness interviews inside that suddenly disappeared. She also had the footage of the funeral and she had seen what was on it but that was now gone too. This footage allegedly showed that two officers were at this funeral, which was only concerning considering that some had said there was a connection between the gun used and officers, considering it was a 40 caliber, which is what Detroit officers used. When the lieutenant of this police department began to focus on officers possibly being involved, he was suddenly transferred and he had been working there for 31 years. He was told he was asking too many questions. Then a year later in 2004, when this case still was not solved and due to the mishandling of Tamara's case, the chief of police decided to reassign it to the cold case squad unit. This was said to put it in a safe place and it was not to be discussed anywhere else. This was super odd to the officers in this squad who were receiving it considering this was less than a year old and it was not yet a cold case. People were still investigating it and they normally only worked on cases that were at least two years old. Sergeant Stevenson said she was absolutely shocked that this case was suddenly just taken from her. She was working on it every day. She was finding new leads and suddenly it was just pushed to the cold case unit where she could no longer look into it. It didn't stop there either. It was said Sergeant Stevenson was then transferred to another job, but she ended up just moving completely away anyway because she was finding that her home was being broken into repeatedly and officers were seen around the area often. Now, once the cold case unit received this case, they did begin to look into it. And at first they said it did look like Eric Mitchell, Tamara's boyfriend at the time, was the intended target. However, then they started looking deeper. However, they weren't finding any concrete answers because they were running into the same problems that everybody else had prior. They couldn't get answers. Nobody was allowing them to. Things just kept disappearing and a cell phone that was found at the crime scene vanished as well. But this wasn't the worst part because the leader of this squad began branching out, reaching out to other officers to get help to solve this case. And they were getting closer to uncovering answers when the entire cold case squad was shut down. They were told that everyone was going to be transferred to different departments and the squad was no longer going to be active. And even though from the beginning, investigators had this tip that Tamara Green was at the party at the mayor's home, it didn't appear to really ever be looked into. And Mayor Kilpatrick was never brought in for questioning. However, he was dealing with his own criminal charges five years later. You see, Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick was the youngest elected mayor. And in 2008, he had been caught in a scandal. He had been found to be having an affair with his chief of staff, Christine Beatty. And he lied about this after text had been found between the two of them, basically proving it. Christine stepped down from her position immediately, but the mayor basically refused to until he did plead 
guilty. He was brought to trial and he ended up being sentenced to four months in jail with five years probation and owed the city a million dollars. At this trial, he was called arrogant and defiant. It was also said that Kwame put his friends and family members on the payroll even though they weren't working, and used $25,000 of the city's money to rent a or to lease a car for his wife. This was all while the city of Detroit was struggling. Kwame Kilpatrick did not speak in court, but his lawyer discussed the fallen leader's mood after the hearing. He's somber and he's committed to moving on. Committed to moving on. The ex-mayor pleaded guilty last month to lying about having a sexual relationship with his chief of staff, Christine Beatty, during a whistleblower trial. Back in January, the Detroit Free Press released several steamy text message exchanges between Kilpatrick and Beatty that pointed to an affair. The Wayne County prosecutor filed criminal charges against the pair two months later. While Beatty stepped down, Kilpatrick held on to his position until he entered his plea last month. And although Tamara's case has been handled by many different people, it's inactive today, and an $100,000 reward was actually offered for information, and then an anonymous donor doubled this, so it's $200,000 today. But still, no more tips are coming in. People are still scared to talk about what happened and scared to even get involved. And that's when Tamara's family decided they had enough. And in 2010, they actually sued the city of Detroit and the former mayor, claiming that the investigation was intentionally stifled. Now, their attorney said, we don't have text messages here that demonstrate that Kwame Kilpatrick thwarted the murder investigation. We don't have hidden video footage of Kwame Kilpatrick at the shredder, and we don't have the clandestine recording of Kwame giving someone instructions, but you're not required to have that. Basically, they were going off a gut feeling. They were going off rumors that were spread, but rumors that had so much truth to them, and they wanted something done, and they felt like the entire reason the investigation didn't go anywhere was because Kwame kept it quiet. Now, Kwame's lawyer actually stepped down after this. He had been with him through that whole, you know, scandal with him having an affair, but when it came to this, he stepped down, and the federal judge decided to keep the documents of this case sealed, claiming that the investigation was still ongoing. However, then investigators suddenly came forward saying, oh yeah, we know Tamara's killer. We just can't tell you because the investigation is still happening. Even though they had never said anything about this before, Tamara's family had never been told. They also asked for the lawsuit to be thrown out because they would have to look into things in the investigation that they weren't ready to give out yet. Well, Alicia, the city claims to know who Tamara Green's killer is, but they apparently don't want to reveal that just yet. And so tomorrow, here in federal court, they will ask the judge to toss out her family's lawsuit against the city. Lawyers for the city of Detroit say they know who killed Tamara Green, the exotic dancer who reportedly danced at a rumored party at the Manoogian Mansion in 2002. But they say they cannot have her suspected killer identified publicly because it may compromise the investigation and jeopardize the safety of an informant. All that is why city attorneys want to file a secret motion to dismiss the lawsuit filed by Green's family against the city. Green's family believes the city under Kwame Kilpatrick's administration delivered deliberately botched the investigation into her murder. The motion reportedly says that for the city to properly defend itself in the lawsuit, they would have to disclose evidence that would identify the alleged killer, something they're apparently not ready to do. And the federal judge in the lawsuit has ordered that some previous filings be kept under seal. It'll be interesting to see if he allows the city to keep what's in this latest filing a secret. The family had asked for all evidence in the investigation, including Kwame's emails for the time period around the murder. However, these were found to all been deleted and then deleted from the deleted folder. They did beg for cell phone records and the city did have to release it these and what they found was actually quite alarming. It is said that most of the numbers that were calling Tamara at this time were 999 or 220, which go back to Detroit's government employees. Right off the bat, if there's any match with any of the upper echelon in the city of Detroit, that would that would give pause because they've all told us they didn't know who Tammy Green was. But of course, what phone calls and when those phone calls are, I mean, the timing could be more than just curious. So who was exotic dancer Tamara Green talking to 
among the friends, associates, and employees of then-Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick? And why are numbers with the city's prefix, 999 or 220, so often found in Green's cell phone records? Tammy Green's telephone bill is replete with phone calls to and from 999 and 220. Now, we know that 999 and 220 are the exchanges used by the city of Detroit employees. We'd like to know if she was in communication with any of those folks in the days leading up to her death. If they can be matched with Green's cell phone records, the names of the people, city appointees or workers Green was in contact with before she was murdered, could be very important information that could help indicate if she was talking about dancing at the never-proven Manoogian Mansion party. If after that party she was contacted about money she has told friends she would receive, not to talk about the alleged assault by... Kwame Kilpatrick's wife Carlita at that party. It would be more powerful information for Yatuma's case against Kilpatrick and the city. I believe in my clients, I believe in their cause, and I don't believe a single word that comes out of the mouths of my defendants. Basically all the family had was witnesses who were willing to come forward and possibly you know, risk their life to talk about what they knew, but they did have nine people who told the story of that night where Tamara had gone to this party, she had gone to the hospital, and th this was all a few months prior to her murder. But it was said that she stayed in the hospital under an alias of a Detroit police officer who was also an exotic dancer. This civil lawsuit was then thrown out when they were told they had a lack of evidence. But not only was this heartbreaking to the Green family, they now felt like absolutely nothing was being done nor would ever be done to bring justice to Tamara. This is when a 911 dispatcher came forward saying that Tamara had called her that night of the party. Her name was Sandy Cardenas and she said that Tamara told her Carlita Kilpatrick had punched her, had assaulted her. And prior to this, that same night, but just a little while earlier, Sandy said she also received several calls for officers to come to that very mansion that night. But when officers arrived, they couldn't get in. They weren't being allowed to get in. That's when it said they decided to go and pick up Carlita Kilpatrick, his wife, from their other home and bring her to get into the residence. But when they did, she got there and the assault occurred. She said, Sandy said, so many officers were at this mansion at this time that when other people were calling for police, no one was being sent out because they were all tied up at this mansion. She said that the next day, all of those 911 tapes from the night prior were just gone and they didn't go away that quickly. Another officer then recalled being called to the mansion that night for an officer down. However, then he was called again and told he didn't need to come and not to worry about it. However, this officer who came forward saying that said he didn't believe it was Tamara that was hurt that night. He believed that it was the exotic dancer who was also a police officer who was injured that night and that's why at the hospital her name was used instead of Tamara's. But then why did that one EMS say that they saw Tamara with a swollen eye. Now, some of the documents were eventually unsealed from the trial, and this is what it said that Kwame said during some of these trials. And even though former Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick took the fifth many times, he answered many times as well. I was thinking about protecting my wife, and I was protecting my children from embarrassment and protecting myself, said former Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick when asked about lying about his affair with then Chief of Staff Christine Beatty. That was in the original whistleblower lawsuit, but asked in federal court in the case surrounding the drive-by shooting of dancer Tamara Green, filed by her children, and alleging the city obstructed the investigation into her death. That case was thrown out November 1st. As for the never-proven party at the Manoogian Mansion, where Green allegedly danced and then was assaulted by the mayor's wife, Carlita, Kilpatrick said, I believe that this purported rumor that you keep alive is as ridiculous now as it was then. Kilpatrick said he heard about the rumor in barber shops. He also said his wife, she did not know Tamara Green, she's never assaulted anyone. When questioned about the former federal monitor of the Detroit Police Department and his reported sexual encounter with her, he was asked, why did you get involved with Cheryl Robinson Wood on a personal level? Kilpatrick answered, because I was not right. I had a cheating spirit and I am paying very dearly for it. 
He said he had sex with her one time. Kilpatrick also testified that he believed that his sexual relationship with Robinson and his longtime relationship with Christine Beatty never resulted in inappropriate personnel decisions. Then one of the cold case squad members who had been working on this case before the whole squad was just shut down came forward with information. He said that basically after he was kicked out of there, he retired, but he started working at Crime Stoppers to help with getting tips for murder cases. But that's when he started going back through old ones and he found that multiple tips had been sent his way about the Tamara case, but he never received them. He said that he then sent them to the police department once again, so they hopefully would receive them this time. However, nothing has been done about them again. Then in 2013, Operation Bombay Dreams had uncovered even more. This was that Kwame and many others were then found guilty of 24 public corruption charges involving missing money, kickbacks, and bribes. He was sentenced to 28 years. However, he has served eight of those years and this year, or actually it would have been last year, it was rumored that he was moved out of this prison due to the virus and was basically put into home confinement with his mother instead. But another former police officer named Mark Carlisle said that he found that Tamara wasn't killed by Kwame or anybody involved with him, but was killed by a man named Derrett Little D King. Derrett at this time is actually behind bars for another attempted murder and claims that he didn't do this and also said that the survivor, who was Eric Mitchell, says that it's not him that did it and it was not him that he saw pointing the gun at them, so that makes him innocent. However, his wife did own a white SUV at the time that looked like what Eric Mitchell said the killer's car was. There were also rumors that Derrett and Eric Mitchell were also in a feud at this time that could have resulted in Derrett wanting to kill him. The lead cold case police detective in the case is certain the killing had no ties to the mayor. The fact is, I uncovered nothing regarding Kwame Kilpatrick's involvement in this murder. Now retired, Detroit Police Homicide Detective Mike Carlisle later confirmed that his 18 months of investigation had concluded Darrett Little D. King was the most likely suspect, that the April 30th, 2003 drive-by shooting, the attack on Strawberry's car, left her as collateral damage and not the intended target. It was an attempted assassination of the passenger a drug dealer named Eric Mitchell. Now from state prison, behind the walls of the Macomb Correctional Facility in New Haven, Derrick King speaks of the accusation for the first time and insists he didn't do it. You say that you had nothing to do with her death. Exactly. I took lie detector tests. The victim said I didn't do it. I mean, what else could you ask for? The victim said you didn't do it. Yeah. It is the, the survivor. Yeah. Indeed, the survivor was Eric Mitchell, who was shot five times, while the driver, Tamara Green, was shot three times. She was behind the wheel, closest to the street and the drive-by vehicle. Are you surprised that they named you publicly, but they haven't come to you with charges? Yeah, of course. That's crazy. It tore my life to pieces with that. My family, kids, everything. King is now serving 14 to 25 years in state prison for attempted murder and other charges not related to the Green case. But for several reasons, Carlisle believes he should be charged in Green's murder. The fact that King is left-handed, as was the shooter, according to witnesses. The fact that officers, first at the scene, said Mitchell told them Little D was the person that he was having problems with. And then there's the statement made by a big-time drug kingpin named Tommy Hodges, who claims Little D admitted to him he was responsible for the drive-by. And Tommy Hodges gave me a statement about Little D approaching him and told him what had occurred that night. Now, one of the things Tommy Hodges asked Little D was, well, why, what about the old girl? And the only thing Little D told him, she was in the way. Everything that Carlisle ever did uh, pertaining to me, is a dead end and it's made up everything. Every, if you look at the statements, you look at the evidence, Carlisle is just a crooked cop and hopefully it'll come out in the, in the future. But something that I find really odd is that the survivor wasn't more involved with the investigation. I don't think it's that common for a survivor just to not have any input when he saw and remembered everything that occurred. 
I think that he should have been brought in and questioned about if he knew this person, if it really was the person he said he got into a fight with, if that person was Derrett. I mean, th there's just so many possibilities and things that were not done in this case that is so frustrating. Tamara's children are growing up and they desperately want closure. Her son, Jonathan, believes that the city of Detroit covered up his mother's murder. And her daughter, Ashley, has actually now stepped out to talk about her mother's murder in hopes to get her justice. To the person or the people who took your mother's life, if you could say something to them, what would you say? I'd say that I hate them. I do. I hate that my life's the way it is because of something they decided to do. Who is your mom? Tamara Green. How old were you when you lost your mom? I was seven. What would you say to your mother? I'd just say that I love her and that I miss her. How has this changed you? It's changed me a lot. I have a lot of you know, mental damage from just this one incident. And people don't understand how that affects my entire life. This case is still unsolved, so if you have any information, please call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-773-2587. But do you think something horribly wrong happened at this party? Was this one huge cover-up? Or was Tamara the unfortunate victim in a drive-by shooting that was meant to target her boyfriend and not her? But you would think that they would have made sure that her boyfriend was deceased as well if that was the case. There are so many possibilities in this case, but I think one thing we can say for certain is that the investigation was botched. In many ways, whether, you know, for whatever reason you believe, things were not done. And I don't think it was for lack of trying for the good investigators because there were many that I found that worked on this case that still want to do things that still want to be involved and really cannot because they have not they have never been allowed to or they were until they got too good and too close and then they were forced to stop this is not okay to have happened Tamara Green should not have been killed. We need to know what happened at that party, who exactly was there, who's keeping their mouth shut, and why, and why so many officers stayed for so long at a party where they were called, and nobody knows what occurred. And if this did happen months prior to Tamara's murder, was this something that, did she say that she was gonna speak out about it, and that's why they killed her, or, why was there that time period between the party and her death? What prompted them to kill her? Or was it them at all? And there is definitely, definitely foul play involved. So I really hope that you have enjoyed Foul Play February. If you didn't know, I posted all month long for Foul Play February. I posted so much content. So if you need to catch up, there will be a playlist linked down below where you can watch all of them from this year and from last year, I believe. And don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.